Good afternoon from London and welcome all. It's great to have such a large group of VR enthusiasts and sales and marketing pioneers joining us for the webinar today. And for those of you not listening live, you've been lucky enough to receive a recording of the webinar. So yes, the webinar is being recorded and will be shared with all registrants. The immersive nature of VR allows you to create worlds and experiences for your customers that will allow you to develop relationships that build on emotion, excitement, and awe. But what are brands really looking for to, to use VR for? And what's realistic in terms of campaign investment in this early stage of the industry's development? This panel of experts from brands and agencies blazing the trail will uncover the key things consumer-facing brands need to be thinking about when looking to create the best VR experiences. This panel will also be taking place at VRX Europe 2018, Europe's leading senior level immersive tech event. The event will be held in Amsterdam in a few months on the 17th and 18th of May. If you are interested in joining us, you can take advantage of the exclusive discount for webinar registrants, which will be shared at the end of this webinar. But for now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Firstly, we have Alistair Thompson, International Executive Vice President at The Mill. We have Shamarin Pirabai, Global Digital Project Management Lead for GSK, and Saul Rogers, Chief Executive Officer at Rewind. Alex Wills, unfortunately, won't be joining us and sends his apologies. Now to our panelists. Would you like to start off by saying a few words about yourself and, and your experience in the space? Let's start with you, Alistair. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, gosh, I've been uh, with the mill now for a rather long time, about 19 years. Um, and um, I guess I've got the international bit in my title because I've moved around a lot. So I spent a long time in New York uh, helping to set the mill up in America um, and then have done quite a bit with our other offices and getting things going. Um, so I've been a bit of a, a pathfinder role, I guess, in terms of, of expanding our business. Um, and then most recently, um, I've been quite focused um, specifically on automotive and um, coming up with new solutions and ideas uh, to do uh, interesting or create interesting content for the automotive industry. So that's my, that's my story so far. Excellent. Um, Shamarin, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, hi, yes, I'm Shamarin and I work at GSK as a global digital product manager um, and that includes both you know, web and emerging technologies. Um, but I work in our HIV division. So what we're really looking at exploring these technologies for is how we can help to reduce some of the stigma faced by people living with HIV. You wouldn't think that that was still the issue today, but actually it is quite uh, still widespread uh, issue, as well as um, we're looking at how to use this for interactive data visualization. And I'll be speaking at uh, VRX on um, how we're kind of using the power of VR to bring our clinical trial data to life. Um, uh, it's really you know, a compelling way for sales reps to get the doctor's attention because they might go into a call and doctors are completely distracted. They're looking at their cell phone, they're being interrupted. Um, but by using VR, you know, you have their full attention, you can, um, you know, get rid of any distractions, and you can really um, immerse them in, in exploration of the clinical trial data. That's very memorable. It's a lot more memorable than a PowerPoint or, you know, a clinical, uh, you know, paper that they might read. Um, and it's something that they really remember and it's very impactful and compelling and they're much more likely to, to share it with colleagues. So it's really a great tool and that's some of the ways that we're using this technology. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I look forward to hearing about it at VRX. Um, Sol, would you like to um, say a little bit about yourself? Sure, um, so I'm I'm filling in for Alex at <laughs> last minute, but I'm very honored to be part of the panel today and the webinar. Um, so I'm the founder of Rewind. Um, we're a content studio that uses creative technology, and we've been got very well known for 
creating high quality virtual reality work for brands over the last four or five years. Um, I'm also the chair of Immerse UK, which is a UK government funded body to support the immersive industries across entertainment, advertising, through simulation training and beyond. Um, and I'm also the new chair of BAFTA's new immersive entertainment group. Um, I also have a, a, a part-time role as a university professor teaching animation and visual effects and emerging tech. So I have a lot of different hats I wear, but at the moment we're very much focused um, on how we can create value for our brands and our clients within VR and AR and beyond into mixed reality. Excellent, Sol. That's fantastic. Um, well, we'll move into our questions. Um, so to the audience, um, we will be taking questions uh, after after the panelists have reflected on each main question. So um, please do put them into the um, into the system, and I'll refer back to them once uh, we've we've finished with the main question. Um, so. To get started, as mentioned, the immersive nature of VR allows you to create worlds and experiences that allow big brands to connect with their customers on a new level. So, Alistair, Shamarin and Sol, what are brands really using VR for? And what are some of the best examples of brands using VR and AR and immersive tech to develop exceptional relationships? Um, would you like to start off, Alistair? Um, yeah, sure. Um, if you don't mind, I'll sort of blend VR and AR um, together a little bit. Um, I think one Absolutely. of the one of the things that I, I really feel at the moment is a lot of it. A lot the driving force behind all of these mediums tends to be real time technology, um, and and where real time technology is going is probably one of the things that interests me the most. Um, I think um, I think brands are are trying a lot of things out at the moment. And and one of the things that we're finding ourselves focused on, although we are a company, the mill, that has a tradition in advertising and marketing, and that's obviously a huge part of who we are. Um, we're bringing, we've been brought in as well to create uh, tools um, that are very practical um, for brands um, that actually help them do things within their organizations um, that can then instantly sort of be flipped and turned into something that is also very effective for marketing and, and advertising for them. Um, as an example, I'm, I'm in the, the car side of things. Um, one of the, the tool sets that we've developed in the last couple of years is, um, well, one product is a, a product called the Blackbird, um, which is a, a motion vehicle, a capture vehicle for cars. So it allows us to create very, very, um, photo real CG cars. Um, but one of the things that we immediately found out when we built that was that uh, it's quite abstract shooting with a, a, a vehicle that uh, is then going to become something else in CG later. Um, so we, we very quickly moved towards augmented reality and trying to uh, create a, a, a version of that vehicle over our Blackbird motion capture device um, on set or on location that immediately makes the director or the clients feel like that product is actually there um, on set and on location with them. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we're seeing that suddenly grow legs and, and move into all sorts of different directions um, because we're seeing our clients really take much more ownership of, of kind of principally the thing that is most important to a lot of these manufacturers, which is their design. Um, if you're a car manufacturer, or if you're an architectural firm, or if you make washing machines or any big product, you know, a hard object, um, the thing that is perhaps most important to you is your, is your actual um, design of the, your product. And we're seeing manufacturers and brands taking more ownership of this and, and realizing that they can create a lot more content and a lot more useful interactivity with this never before. Now, internally, a brand that might mean visualizing and testing and engineering their products um, by using augmented reality and VR to get to a point much more quickly where they're understanding what's you know, going to work and not work um, in terms of how something looks, how it emotes, and how it works. And then that 
quite quickly then transfers into a sort of marketing advertising side of, of, of the coin as well because the, 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 the uh, consumers want to see those products and want to understand them sooner than ever before. And the way manufacturing uh, processes go these days, there's not a lot of gap between the point of design to actually manufacturing and getting thousands and thousands of these objects out uh, to the public. And actually, sometimes the public want to know and understand and configure and personalize and buy something before it's actually ready, readily available for them to see in the real world. So AR, VR, etc., offers a fantastic way of giving them um, experiences, uh, maybe in-store experiences or, or uh, multi-user broadcaster experiences, again, through VR, AR, um, that will, will bring those products to them uh, much earlier on in the process, um, at a very high end and, and high fidelity level as well. So uh, a lot of what we're doing is, say, is very much focused around how to bring the, the design and product to life um, in a very, very realistic manner that, that then provides interactive experiences, both for the people working within a business organization and for those people who want to buy products from that, that brand and organization too. Excellent. Um, would would uh, the other panelists like to reflect on that, or or would you do you have another example of um, of a, a great use? Yeah, I I, I do. So um, I think it's a pretty interesting thing that over the last four or five years, when we've been looking at um, connecting VR um, in the marketing advertising space, which is where a lot of brands have been using it is it's been used for PR and we've seen the world's first insert something VR project um, really being done to death. Um, it hasn't been the best thing for the virtual reality industry overall, overall because a lot of those projects hadn't been given the love and quality that they needed to be done for actual consumers. Um, but it has allowed a lot of people to do a lot of R&D. Um, what we really need, though, is the next phase for advertising and marketing to go into virtual reality is actually a user base. The number of consumers is still pretty low. At the end of last year, we were hitting the kind of 15 million mark across the board. But what we what we are going to see over the next year is that really, really start to accelerate, A, through the Windows Mixed Reality headsets being um, delivered across five different OEMs. So there's going to be a lot more people with PC-tethered headsets of high quality. But also the mobile market is going to get standalone devices, so the Oculus Go, uh, the new Daydream through Lenovo, and the HTC Focus, which, so the Vive Focus is only in China at the moment. But those ones are all gonna be about sub $200, which is very, very cheap compared to the current high price point to get into virtual reality. Um, they are mobile powered, so they aren't quite as powerful as um, Alistair and I would like to, to deliver the highest quality VR through um, real-time engines but they are going to build a really strong base. Um, but alongside that, this, the AR part of what's been going on, and this, we've seen this a lot, is that AR is being used to allow us to get that um, breadth because that can be delivered through any one mobile device almost, um, which is you know, the mobile market is 2.16 billion smartphones in the world. Not all AR enabled yet, but they're getting that way. But because of the content we're creating lives in a real-time engine, Unreal or Unity or something similar, and we are creating this content for VR, we can all begin to create it to live in the AR space as well. Um, again, we had a bit of a run at AR a few years ago, um, and a lot of people were doing activated posters or magazines coming to life, which really didn't use the technology to its real power and key. But if you look at some of the stuff that's being done now, so I'm just thinking about uh, the IKEA application, AR application, which is incredibly simple. It allows you just to put AR uh, furniture in your house, but because it's accurately placed and it's 3D and you see it really in your room, you can make design um, decisions and purchase decisions right there and then to see whether it fits with your room. So AR is really building a bedrock, I think, that VR will be able to bounce off the top of moving forward. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And we will have IKEA speaking on that exact topic at VRX um, Europe 2018. So uh, next, I mean, Shamarin, did you want to reflect on that or did you have um, another case study that you'd like to mention? 
Yeah, I think um, just to kind of play on the AR theme, I think really one of the best examples that our company has done uh, was an AR um, uh, experience created by um, Exeterin. So Exeterin is a migraine medication. It's mainly marketed in the US, so you might not have heard of it. Um, but uh, one of the biggest frustrations of people that suffer from migraines is that people who have never had a migraine, they have no idea what it feels like to live with one. Um, and it's really interesting use case where we used AR and we picked volunteers who suffered from migraines and every migraine is different. So you might see spots, you might see auras and we replicated their unique migraine symptoms. And then the fun part was they got to pick a volunteer um, to live a day in the life of their migraine. So some people would pick their spouse, some people would pick a family member, really brave person pick their boss. Um, and they put on this AR um, headset and they had to walk around in the real world all day and experience that person's migraine. And it was just really amazing to see the impact that it had because they came out of this experience and they really had an understanding and and empathy for what it's like to suffer with this. And they finally like understood that, you know, a migraine is not just a bad headache. And they understood that just through the power of this medium without any of the physical side effects that people that have migraines also experience. So I think it really speaks to the power of VR and how it can kind of change people's mindsets. It can create empathy um, and it can really um, be impactful in the world. So I think, you know, it's, I think that's one of our best case studies. Fantastic. Um, and before we take some questions from the audience, was there, did you guys, other panelists, would you like to reflect on, on that at all? Just the, um, the, you know, it's phenomenal that you've actually used VR for something which um, is really can only be done in that medium. There's been a lot of other ways of we're trying to convince the mind we're seeing something else, but flipping over what a lot of people are doing, we're using VR for, for a treatment. So in the medical sense, to treat phobias or PTSD or anything else, but to use it as a tool to really show um, and show a broader, broader audience and show people's spouses what, um, what it feels like to have a migraine. It seems like a really bold choice to take um, what VR could be used for to push it forward and actually move the conversation along. So I just thought it's something really interesting to do there. I think it's an interesting point that VR, AR, these, these experiences don't always have to be entertainment in the classic sense of the word of, you know, enjoyment and, uh, uh, and, and, and escapism. It, it can be very educational sometimes and actually providing a very moving experience that's educational uh, that cannot be achieved in any other way, um, I think is incredibly powerful and is perhaps underused a little bit at the moment in, in the AR, VR world. I think one of the best projects we've ever worked on um, was when we did a project with Guardian, um, the Guardian, and um, it was to illustrate how uh, how awful the living conditions are um, if you're living in solitary confinement. Now, it doesn't sound like an experience you'd, you'd jump to do uh, as, a, as a VR piece, but overwhelmingly, people remembered it, understood the, you know, the, the, the sort of debate much more than they ever would have done um, by actually feeling like they were experiencing a cell um, in a prison in a way that you would only do otherwise if you were there. Um, and it really did, you know, open up the debate and the, the questions as to whether it's the right or wrong thing to do for society. And I think there's there's much more of that we can do um, with VR, AR in terms of opening up questions and, and, and providing a, a forum and a way of of really sort of uh, challenging uh, society and things in the future. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I was going to mention the six by nine thing. It's a phenomenal piece. Um, what brands have been trying to do for years is trying to connect with an audience and trying to connect with them emotionally if they can. And luckily, we've got incredibly good at video, and especially what you guys in the middle have been doing. Crafting film that within 10 or 15 seconds of a commercial can emote something and connect with someone and communicate a brand uh, message or product across. But if you look at anything in feature film or any of the more longer form stuff, what we're really trying to do is make that 
technology disappear, so make the screen disappear, so we have a suspension of disbelief. And with the right films, we forget we were in the cinema at all until the very, very end. Um, and for the bad ones, we realize exactly where we are all the way through it. But with VR, specifically with VR, especially if you consume it through a headset, um, you, have, you are completely immersed and you are transported somewhere else. Um, and you believe like you're there. The, we don't need a suspension of disbelief. We believe what we're seeing is true. And so for, for connecting, a, connecting a, for a brand to connect the consumers through that, technology is phenomenal because you have them 100% engaged with you, 100% focused, and you can really connect with them emotionally. But you have to make sure what you are connecting with them emotionally is something they want to consume. You have brought them somewhere, and hopefully what you're going to do is give them something that they can take away and talk about afterwards. It doesn't necessarily, as we spoke about, have to be a positive. It doesn't have to be happy and exciting. It can be something far more impactful and meaningful if it's done in the right way that people will take away and then talk about and then take action on. Fantastic, guys. Um, and now we do have some questions from the audience. This one is directed at, um, at Alistair. Um, where do you think the auto industry will stand in terms of the adoption of ARMR for advertising marketing purposes in comparison to other industries? And why or what consumer facing use cases for AR will be the most significant for brand in the next 12 months? Um, I think um, AR, uh, VR, MR, <laughs> all of those. Um, and actually real-time technology as a sort of backbone to, to those uh, viewing experiences are incredibly relevant to the automotive industry, in part because it's one of the few industries that, that shares kind of a, a universal type of product. You know, every, every auto manufacturer is essentially selling uh, a, a vehicle, a four-wheeled vehicle, uh, that, you know, they, they have nuances and differences, but they all share the same type of, of, of physical presence. Um, now, that means for uh, actually creating uh, versions of them, uh, visualizations of them, every manufacturer has that same challenge. How do I, how do I get my, my vehicle design uh, visualized and in front of the consumer in an engaging way, um, perhaps before, you know, as I say, they're available to market uh, and available to immediately buy and end up on your doorstep. In part as well, because the automotive industry is is more and more about um, creating bespoke or tailor-made um, products for for consumers as well. So the the auto industry has long been about configuration. So for, for years, there's been the ability to pop online, configure your car, um, and see what it looks like, and then you know that might be something you want to to buy. But that's becoming much more sophisticated now. So the, the the next sort of generation of content that will be will be out there will be blending all of these mediums together. So how do I see a you know piece of high end brand advertising that I can um, alter and make more personalised? Can I take an advert and can I put my car of choice within it? Can I put me within that car? Can I have a look at the interior of that car and the exterior? during that experience. When it comes to, to buying cars, uh, everything's changes as well, changing as well within the auto industry that, again, pushes towards these new ways of visualizing. So where once upon a time you would go to a car showroom and there would be hundreds of cars on a car lot that you would be able to literally walk amongst and choose one, Nowadays, you don't want to choose one or they're not even there to have a look at. Um, you're going into potentially a, a much smaller environment in the middle of your city. Um, you're, you're choosing what that car is going to look like that you will actually buy in the end. And you're wanting to see it visualized, brought to life and, and made to look like the, the choices that you're you know, asking to be made there and then. And then pressing a button and ordering that and it will be delivered in the near future. So... I think, again, that the unification of the product and the type of product that car manufacturers have and that level of personalization and configuration that is always applied makes the car industry very, you know, um, very focused on getting 
experiences out there in terms of AR, VR, and again, real time is a sort of uh, is the the backbone to all of that as well happening. Absolutely, I know that when we when I was doing research for VRX, um, auto and aviation were such a big big part, and they have a really large presence in our enterprise track on day two of VRX. Um, now, there, there's another question um, from a, a woman, Jane, from Eon Reality. Um, she says she's been working with GSK and is really excited to be a part of the webinar. Um, for the whole panel, though, as the customer journey becomes just as important as the point of conversion, how do you see VR being a sustainable and repeatable part of the buyer's decision experience? Um, yes, I think I think I know the project that uh, you might have worked on. Was it the multiple sclerosis uh, simulator? Um, well, I should probably can't answer. Um, but yeah, I think that um, one of the key things that in the medical field is really great for us to use this technology is to allow people to understand the mechanism of action in the body of of how our drugs uh, affect whatever condition they have as well in, in like the MS space um, with this, I think what her project was, uh, was to allow people to understand actually what is, um, you know, MS uh, like and what are some of the scientific challenges because actually it's still disease that um, scientists do not fully understand themselves. And VR allowed us to kind of um, show, uh, you know, normal people that aren't scientists or clinicians, uh, you know, how complicated this, disease is to treat and then really understand the disease more and as well kind of join forces with us and kind of have a little bit of empathy for us of like we're trying our best to um, find uh, medications that can cure this but it's very complicated um, and um, you know here is how our, our, our products can work but it's it, it's a journey that we're going on with scientists as we explore more of, of how this disease um, is you know replicated in you know every unique individual. So I think for at least in the medical sense, it helps kind of bring understanding. And I guess maybe in the Alistair has some of this in the product life cycle. You know, um, it's it's not always perfect from start to finish. It's a journey. You have to you iterate. And I think it, it can kind of help bridge that gap between the consumer and the person making their product um, and help kind of um, uh, you know, share empathy as well as gain insights as to, you know, the product development cycle. Fantastic. Alistair or Sol, would you um, like to reflect on that question as well? Um, I, I can say that, yes, on the car side, actually, I totally agree with you that there is, people don't realize potentially, you know, we're used to configuring and, and viewing cars and doing all that as a buyer. But um, again, having built relationships now on the brand side and seeing the amount of internal review and uh, engineering and um, the, the, the level of uh, detail that needs to be gone into to actually get a, a car from the point of the first sketch through to a product that's actually going to be launched is huge. Um, so there's an enormous amount of iterative visualization, sign off, um, and, uh, and, and an enormous amount of people that are involved in that process. And you have to provide um, lots of different ways of, of actually allowing individuals to, to make the right judgment calls in that process as well, because you have to bear in mind, you know, what type of individual you're dealing with, how comfortable they are at dealing with certain types of visualization uh, and giving them the tool sets that they need to, to actually make that judgment. So. You know, some people are fine about putting VR headsets on and being in a singular experience. There are other people who want to share uh, an experience together with colleagues in the same room in natural lighting, which makes augmented reality a much more um, useful product. Others uh, might actually err towards VR because you can you can more easily do a virtual setup and effectively work between offices all over the world. Um, to be judging things together in a VR uh, avatar type setup. Um, and then perhaps for, for other people in the industry, the most important thing is that you've got a, a level of continuity in all the visualizations that you're looking at. So 
if you're judging a car design between multiple continents, you want to make sure that the visualization of the design that comes out of the UK is as high and as you know decent a quality as that that comes out of Japan, and that one isn't given an advantage over another based on the type of medium that they're using or the, or the visualization tool that they've got. So there's lots of iterations and lots of uh, need and requirement for, for, for giving people lots of different access points to view and, and judge these things. Mm -hmm. I think um, just to follow on from that, I think there's um, I think some of the most powerful moments we've seen recently is that social side of it. Um, bringing yourself and a friend into a space together to experience something together collaboratively um, is, is the bit that really tips people over the edge. Remember that Facebook bought Oculus because this is, they think, the future of a computing platform. And they, you know, they are a social media platform first and foremost. Um, I'm not quite sure how quickly we'll get to something like Ready Player One with the Oasis. Um, there are a few people really trying to make that happen faster than everybody um, expects it to, but it's on its way. For us, um, on the car side of it, we helped launch Jaguar's electric vehicle about a year and a half ago. Um, and it was a piece, piece of theater. So we had um, 50 people in LA and another 15 or 20 in London, all in headsets and all seeing each other like they were in a stadium or they were sitting in, around a, a conference. And they could see each other, wave to each other, and they could speak to each other. And then we brought in a live video feed of the designer who could stand in front of them and tilt brush out the vehicle and draw out its forms and really explain about why he crafted this amazing vehicle. We could then bring that thing to life, we could take you into the engine, we could sit you in the, the driving seat, and we could basically treat you as a, an individual throughout the whole experience. And the amazing thing was at the end of this piece, which was a piece of theater more than anything else, um, using VR as the tool to do all of the sets and locations, people spoke about the size of the cabin. They felt like they had sat in this concept vehicle. Um, they can talk about the detail of all the engine structure. They could see, we gave them a wishbone in front of them so they could see the quality of the suspension. And no one had ever seen this stuff in that way. Um, but the technology wasn't the, co the core of it. We thought it would be the most important part of the process, but really it was about the visual fidelity and be able to understand and see form in a way you can't do before. Cars are a complex thing. They have many, many curved surfaces. And whenever we see a render of them or a still or a video, we're, our brain is trying to digest what we're seeing and convert it into what the thing will actually look like. But with VR, because you have stereo, because you can move, you can actually see the changing form of it, and it's absolutely phenomenal. And that's why cars specifically, shoes, and architectural visualization has been so important um, for virtual reality as we move across. But um, to, similar to Alistair's point, we had Jaguar's design team in the office of, um, to have a design review of what we'd created, because we were creating the first version of it before there was even anything that had come off CAD. And I, put the head, and I was you know, being politely quite nervous because this was their thing and we were running this in real time, this wasn't a pre-rendered sequence, and I was worried about visual fidelity and quality and anti-aliasing and reflections and all the things that are technically difficult. But the designer were then lent over to the kind of um, uh, glove box area and was looking really intently at it, lent back to his friend and said, well, we should really look at the way the wood grain moves across that surface. And so they were making design decisions and iterations about what they were seeing in front of them because this was one of the first time they'd seen their vehicle in any format. Um, and taking that process down, so now pretty much all um, manufacturing companies, designs, anybody looking at um, products are looking at their objects and their, their products in virtual reality first because it's such, like you said, Alistair, such an iterative form to get us there and sp speeds up and um, slows down on waste. Yeah, what was fantastic about that project, I, I thought it was brilliant, it was also how it blended, you say it was a theatrical piece, but you're exploding that sort of theatrical nature and you're effectively broadcasting something. Um, you're mixing all of the benefits and, as you say, the level of detail that you can get into with, with uh, VR, but you're then bringing, bringing people into it. And I think, I think that's such a big component, as you said, of, of where VR, AR is going to go is, is not making it so much of a singular experience, but giving you all of that immersiveness of a singular experience, but bringing avatars or bringing people into it and actually allowing boundaries to be greatly reduced um, as, as a you know as a byproduct of that so really making things yeah. more intimate than ever before potentially 
It was only run as, um, like I said, about these uh, 60 odd people all at a time. I mean, admittedly, part of them were in London was the real hook that we could bring all these people together. Um, but the second stage up from that is that we can now release that application for anyone with a VR headset to come to that live event and be part of it. So it's almost broadcasting an event in, through virtual reality. Um, and the real key was that it wasn't captured 360 video. It wasn't a stage show. Everything was running inside the engine so we could take that world and distribute it anywhere we wanted around the planet. We did look at um, bringing in the designers as volumetric captures or 3D avatar versions of themselves, but they never really gave us that feeling of presence, sadly, of a human, because we're always so used to looking at humans in, in, in tricky detail. Even with $100 million worth of visual effects, we never quite get them to look photo real. So we decided to use them as a green screen video element in stereo and brought them in instead, and it worked phenomenally well. There were a whole bunch of technical challenges to get that video in there running in real time and distribute it, but it was one of the key things to get, play to the strengths of the real time engine. They're incredibly good at doing um, uh, physical objects and designed objects, but they get they begin to fall down when you get to organics, and especially once you start getting to characters. We are getting closer to it, but it's still a little ways off. Well, guys, uh, we can definitely say that um, we've established that um, VR, AR, and immersive tech are definitely making waves in the marketing sales space. Um, but building on that and where you have seen success, could you reflect on what's realistic in terms of campaign investment at this early stage of the industry's development? Uh, yeah, we can look at that. So there's, there is... Um Campaign investment's a strange one. Well, it's not a strange one, it's a very straight one. It's what's your ROI? What is your return on investment for what you're putting into it? Um, and as I said earlier, the, the PR part of doing the activity, being the world's first and getting a, using a new piece of technology just because you can, kind of came and went, thank goodness. But there was a time for a year when, as I said, the world's first VR something was uh, put out onto Engadget and Gizmodo and Wired and everything else. And that's really where the value was, sadly. It was in the additional free press that came from doing the activity. Um, but as the industry, the immersive industry is maturing, we're realizing, hope, hopefully, we're, brands are realizing and agencies are realizing, you still need to deliver value. And it's not necessarily um, specifically um, value as in the return on investment, but it's also the value you bring to the consumers. Who is seeing this? Why are they seeing it? And are they having a really great time? Because when it comes down to it, once you have them in VR, you have a very special moment. Like I said, they're 100% engaged in what you're showing them. Um, so we always think about it as, as the industry is going and we don't have the large consumer base to really bring, up, you know, if we put all of our money into creating just the, a real-time interactive uh, VR experience, we know that those, the number of consumers that may see it is going to be far lower than the return that we need. So we always think about how that we can get as many different things out of the assets. So how do you sweat them? Um, so we did a project for Ghost in the Shell last year. Um, we were given a very short time <laughs> turnaround, and it was for Paramount's launch of their new movie. Um, and we created a super premium version of a, what we call a VR vignette. So taking the world and the character and creating them in real time. And we delivered it for Rift. And it had 50,000 downloads, I think, maybe even a little higher. But that's a pretty low number of it. Um, it was pretty quick. It got a lot of press. But we then created a Gear VR version that ran on mobile. And that was in the hundreds of thousands of downloads. But we also then created a 360 video out of that as well. And really edited separately. But again, that was all from the same pipeline. And that's had, um, it's had tens of millions of views. So the breadth of, um, the breadth of uh, conversation through Facebook really has got them an ROI. So return on investment for the money because it is a marketing piece. But then we have also directly connected through Gear VR and through Rift in a new way. So we created a new piece of content, a new piece of marketing to live on these new platforms. So really what I'm saying is about getting the most out of everything you're creating, especially once you have it in real time, is really, really important. And one of the key benefits of doing this type of work, if you just had a three, if you just had 360 video, you could only deliver it in some places. If you just had 2D video, you could only deliver it in some places. But once you get it into a real-time engine, as Alistair said, you have the ability to deliver in virtual reality, augmented, mixed. You have the ability to create 2D videos and 360 videos. They will have to have their own tweaks and their own kind of branches from the core 
um, creating, but you can get a real return on investment from creating the content in the right way. Yeah, I couldn't couldn't agree more. It's I think we're probably all evangelists for this this thing that we call the universal <laughs> asset. And you know, the universal asset again just means giving brands and, and people more control over what they make um, and um, and creating really high end you know brand level uh, content that can sort of be being seen as a pyramid structure. So you create something that's really high end as an asset that's pretty flexible as an asset that can then generate content that has multiple touch points uh, and, and can, you know, as you say, get the ROI because it's connecting on so many different levels and, and allowing for so many new different types of creative engagement, really. And I think the biggest challenge to all of this is not, ironically, it's not technical, a lot of it. Um, there are, obviously, we talked about, Sol's mentioned at the beginning of this, that, that there's naturally challenges in terms of the, the, the apparatus that you have to view some of these things. But if you're actually covering the whole gamut of different types of content solution that are out there, then actually you've got a very wide spread of, of potential people that you can hit. But I think that, the, the, ironically, the thing that's the most challenging is, is, is when we talked about it just at the beginning of this panel, is the legacy side of our businesses. So if we, you know, I constantly am involved with conversations with clients, um, and everyone, you know, has a level of comfort or discomfort with change and doing things differently. And by and large, most of us within the visual industry um, or advertising industry are levels of experts to a degree. And if you're an expert, the last thing you want to do is turn your world upside down, understand that you're no longer an expert and you're having to sort of try new things and do things differently. But, but really, that's what needs to happen a bit more. People need to be a little bit more open uh, to, to trying things and not be afraid of, of, of you know, getting some things wrong. Um, and I think um, another issue is also the mechanics of, of the businesses that we work with and how, how you get natural silos within every organization that you deal with, whether you're dealing with an agency or a, a brand. Um, people have built their businesses around monetizing in a certain way. So if if a, an agency or a brand is monetized by you know charging out for uh, someone or a group of people in the department to do print and another group of people to create a configurator experience for cars someone else to create traditional linear content for tv commercials someone else to do sponsorships etc you've got this sort of natural division of, of of effort and energy and also money um, but the irony is if you can actually smush all of those things together um, by using a universal asset and actually creating content that can, can be used again from all these to hit all these different touch points. You can actually create content that, 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 that goes so much further and I can utilize a pot of cash uh, uh, to hit a, a much greater audience than ever before. But, but people have to feel more comfortable with that and they have to feel more comfortable interacting with each other within their businesses um, and actually sort of taking a bit more of a helicopter view of, 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 of the whole business as, uh, and how they can spend their money more efficiently and, and generate more creative opportunities without feeling afraid of it or, or um, you know, um, like it's, it's going to harm them in any kind of way. It's best to embrace the future rather than, than sort of bury your head from it, really. But it's a human, human nature thing to be afraid of change. Yeah, I mean, I would agree from that being in the corporate perspective. I think a lot of uh, brand and marketing managers, um, they're still even trying to wrap their heads around the digital landscape, let alone, you know, this new technology. And they're really hesitant to invest in something that they don't understand or they don't know how to put an ROI on. Because when they're planning their campaigns and everything, they have to, as you said, Alistair, they have to plan out and prove the ROI that's like, Okay, well, how am I going to do that for something I, I don't even completely understand myself? Um, so I just think um, I've seen a lot of, you know, uh, just taking baby steps, you know, starting really small, um, usually at like trade shows or conferences where you can provide the equipment. Because, again, we know this isn't widespread. We, you know, everybody doesn't have a headset. Um, but it allows them to kind of start small, invest small, see this immediate reaction for themselves when they're there at the trade show, see the impact. 
and then it kind of gets their feet wet and then they're you know maybe next year ready to kind of scale up their investment and, and do a wider um you know bigger scale project and and that's how i've kind of seen it go i mean i work in a highly regulated industry that's a bit slow moving but um you know that that seems to be the level of comfort i think for a lot of big corporates at the moment You've got to be careful of uh, innovation for innovation's sake, and I think that's where the, the luckily the industry is now maturing into that. Um, but it is a scary time. So I, I talk about uh, us living in dog years, you know, seven years in one of development. It used to be that an industry, if you built yourself a company, you got about 10 to 15 years out of it before an innovation would come along and have, make you have to change it. Now I think that's you know, more like two or three. And even for ourselves, I could give you, I could only give you maybe three to six months out of kind of I know where the industry is going before a new platform comes out, a new piece of software comes out, a new piece of hardware comes out, and everything kind of shifts again. And so it's, it's, it's scary that you think there's a, a whole bunch of people that are kind of still kind of weren't getting their heads around what digital is. There's a whole set of consumers that have moved on beyond wanting to consume any of the traditional types of medium that we're trying to communicate with them in. Uh, thank you, panelists. That's fantastic insight. The audience is so engaged. We have so many questions. Um, so building on that, I'd actually like to take it over to the audience really quickly. Um, I, I think it would be great to get some statistics from you as a group. Um, now we're going to bring up a poll. So um, it should be coming up on your screen now. When, um, when will the... Uh, AR be seen as the majority of brands, sorry, when will VR AR be seen by the majority of brands as a must-have component of their marketing mix? A, it is already, B, one to two years, C, three to five years, or D, longer than that? Um, just take a moment to fill this out and speakers um, will ask you your comments on this as well. So the, the poll's being filled out at the moment, um, but well, while, it's, while our audience is having a go at this, would anyone like to reflect on, on that question before we get the results? Um, yeah, I mean, as, as I guess the one person from a brand here, I would still say it's three to five years out, as I just alluded upon. Um, you know, I, I think at least the big corporates, they're just starting to get their feet wet. Um, you know, they're still trying to even understand multi-channel marketing in the digital space. So I think it's it's going to be a ways out, and I think they're not going to see it as a must-have until the um, uh, hardware and technology is ubiquitous amongst um, the crowds, and they know that people have these headsets, they are using them, they know, um, you know, to Soul's point, there's so many different development platforms and devices you can develop for. It's kind of like going back to the you know, beginning of the smartphone of, you know, oh God, we have to develop for how many different platforms. I think um, they're not going to be ready to do it on a large scale or see it as a must have until they they know, okay, there's a certain amount of uh, my target audience here and they have XYZ headset and I can develop for that. I think it also depends on... A lot of... Oh, sorry, gone. You, you go, Alistair. I was going to say, I think it also depends on the type of brand as well, because, I mean, you said, Sol, put it very succinctly, that, that this sort of technology is very relevant to, to certain types of brand because of the product they produce. So, if, again, you said if you're, if you're Nike, if you're producing shoes, if you're producing uh, architecture, if you're producing cars, if you're producing very obvious things that you need to visualize and get in front of people or give configuration or give some level of personalization to, then you probably look at this and say, well, those types of brands have already got this as a component of their marketing um, because they need to get that direct access to the consumer and they need to be seen to lead the technology in that area. But there are other types of brand that are selling products that 
where it's much less relevant and we haven't yet perhaps entered into, as you said, the, the, the level of, uh, of, of touch points of getting the, the medium to people and also haven't really developed the, the ability to connect the, the storyline or narrative as successfully to the, those technologies as we you know, will do, which will enable much more random brands with, with products that are much more varied to perhaps get more out of this type of technology. Absolutely, uh, right, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Sorry, we've um, we've got our results results for the poll, so we're going to show them to um, to the audience and to the panelists. As you can see, um, the results are definitely around the one to two years and three to five years, um, as you've mentioned. However, we have got fifty percent of our audience saying one to two years. Um, Panelists, do, why do you think that um, most of the audience think it's like a little bit coming a little bit earlier than than we have um, previously discussed? I, I think everyone would like it to be quicker than it's going to be. <laughs> we all, you know, it's is the reason there was so much hype around virtual reality and why there was so much money spent on it is because we all once you've seen it and you put a, a, a professional headset on you suddenly go, God, this is phenomenal, and I want to be here, and I want to see this on the consumer. Um, with brands moving into the space, it's pretty tricky, because if you do it wrong, it can be incredibly um, damaging, almost. If you look at um, what, <laughs> what Sony did with the Jumanji film VR, it had nothing to connect you with the brand properly or the movie properly, and wasn't a very good product, so actually got a lot of negative press towards something, which was a perfectly good movie. So when it comes down to one to two years, um, I do believe that in the one to two years mark, there will be a large, a large upswing in the AR and VR market. But really, the three to five is where we're going to see the embedding of the number of consumers, where you will create purely bespoke content to communicate to the audience who use those sorts of devices. The one to two years is where we are still going to be doing cross campaign using the asset in as many different ways as we can and trying to deliver it within the AR space just as much as the VR. But um, it's good to see that the poll has come out that, that, to agrees that it's not already here yet and that we are in the same, we're all speaking pretty much from the same hymn sheet. Yeah, and um, reflecting on what you've just said, what, what really, and moving on to our, our final question actually, I'm aware that we don't have much time left. What does it take to make a good experience? And, and what do consumer facing brands need to be thinking about when looking to create the best VR experiences? I think relevancy is the thing that everyone just needs to remember. Um, there, are, there are a lot of experiences, and, and Sol pointed out, you know, that, that there was the era of doing something because the technology was there, but without really utilizing the technology in any kind of way that was relevant to the viewer or or had some kind of emotive essence to it. And I know it sounds like the dumbest thing, we've all said it many times, but there are still many, many experiences that that, that you see or, or do out there that just, you know, they're throwaway. Um, and it, it just needs a little bit more consideration sometimes on why is someone doing this experience you know what's driving them to want to do it and what are they going to get from it um you know that doesn't always have to be as we discussed straightforward entertainment value yes you can you know create amazing theater um create an amazing experience that is pure entertainment like say the, the void experience you know most of us have trundled down to at the westfield but there are equally other experiences that are just relevant because they either give you a level of connection to something you want to buy or want to build or want to develop um, or they they connect you to to some kind of human element that you you wouldn't be able to experience otherwise and um, we just need to see a bit more of that I think as well um, than we perhaps are at the moment and sometimes perhaps people do get caught up in what's the next thing that's coming out rather than well what's around now what can I do with it that's going to be the most effective you know we, we're, we're harking back some of us to things that we did a year or two ago that are still the most effective pieces that we worked on because they had the right essence of emotion, storytelling and impact to them. We've, we've looked at, worked a lot with clients over the last few years asking them why um, and we've probably turned down as many VR projects as we've taken on because we haven't, we've really worked with the client and said actually this isn't the medium for that. You can communicate that probably 
just as effectively, even more effectively, and communicate to more people with a different medium, a, a video, a pop-up event, uh, a guy in a furry suit on the street, who knows what it is you want to communicate. But VR isn't going to make your idea good or your campaign good or your product good. It's just another medium that you can work with. Them. So you really have to choose, ask why a lot of the time. But if you are going to do it, do it for the right reasons. Like I said before, once you put the headset on, you have real control of someone. You have transported them somewhere else. And you are giving them an experience that you could never have gotten any other way. So we always look at you know why first. And then really consider audience and demographic. Uh, are, are they there? <laughs> so, so we were asked to do a bunch of stuff with um, English heritage. And I didn't think the English heritage demographic might have VR consumer headsets at home quite at this point. So it might not be the direct way to work with it. Then if you are going to do VR AR, consider whether it's passive or active, how much people are going to be involved in the, in the journey. Are they just watching a video play out and they have no agency? Or do they have to build the car or fly the dragon or whatever it's going to be? Um, and then budget. This stuff can be done budget conscious, but really it takes a lot of money and a lot of time to do it very, very well at this point, which is why you need to make a decided decision and how you're going to use it and whether it's really going to be effective for you. Yeah, I think just to add to that as well, I think user experience is also very important because um, a lot of people are still quite new to this medium. So you really need to use a lot of um, audio and visual cues to really guide them through the experience or they might become very frustrated or even worse, they might miss out on your key messages. So I think just taking into account that this is a new medium and the user experience, not only do you not need to make them sick, but you need to guide them through it. You need to, you know, um, you know, really make it a, a, a good experience where they're not getting frustrated um, by it. And I think that's one of the key things that um, defines a good or bad experience in a lot of these uh, applications. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, I mean, there's so much to say. and. And although we've only really touched the tip of the iceberg, it's been fantastic to have you all on board. Um, I want to thank, um, so Alistair Thompson, International Executive Vice President for The Mill, Shimaran Pierpai, Global Digital Product Manager, Management Lead for GSK, and Sol Rogers, Chief Executive Officer at Rewind. Um, I thought there were some great insights shared and I hope you all enjoyed it, I definitely did. As mentioned, we will be sending all of the recordings of this webinar um, to the attendees, should you wish to share it with your colleagues or, or just listen back. Um, there also were a few mentions of the upcoming event, VRX Europe 2018, which will be held on the 17th and 18th of May in Amsterdam this year. Um, all of the speakers that were with us today will be speaking at the event. Um, and we'll continue the discussion on how the immersive nature of VR allows big brands to connect with customers on a new level, but also explore how the adoption of VR and AR across sales and marketing will grow mainstream awareness of immersive tech, as, as a lot of the panelists mentioned today. For information on the event, you can check out our website. We'll be, we will be sending around a link via chat. Um, and if you are interested in joining us, you can take advantage of the discount that we have provided. Um, limited tickets are available for, at this price. Um, so start organizing your team now. And I look forward to seeing you in Amsterdam. Panelist, thank you again. Um, it was wonderful to have you on board. Thank you, a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you everyone and we'll wrap it up now.